Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another fruitful discussion under the subject Science, Technology, and Society. Today, we'll be focusing mainly on science, technology, and nation building, meaning we'll be uh, discussing how science and technology evolved and developed in our uh, country. And we'll be focusing on several periods, some important scientists, and some policies that helped shape science and technology in our country. So let's begin with the pre-colonial period. Now, before the arrival of the Spaniards, Filipinos, early Filipinos are already engaged with trade or in trade with uh, different cultures, particularly the Chinese, the Indonesians, and the Japanese. Now, early Filipinos are actually using we're actually using uh, science and technology as a proof is the uh, creation of the Banawi rice terraces. You know, as we already know, Banawi rice terraces uh, was included before in the Eight Wonders of the World because of its sophistication and pristine uh, and, and its uh, uh, precise engineering. So, you know, before the, uh, before the arrival of the Spaniards, the Americans, and the Japanese, our ancestors are already using science and technology in a practical usage. Let's say, for example, they are applying science and technology when they are farming, when they are hunting for food, when they're doing household chores, and when they are educating their children. You know, um, during the pre-colonial period, children are educated in a vocational way because, you know, uh, like, for example, fathers will teach younger uh, their sons you know, uh, on how to uh, do farming work, on how to hunt for food, and uh, they would pass on you know, some of their responsibilities to them so that when they grow up, they'll become responsible uh, husband and responsible members of the community. And the same goes to uh, women. Uh, mothers teach their uh, daughters how to uh, do household chores, how to prepare food, and how to take care for their siblings. So that's how they use science and technology. Now, please take note that in the early times, during the pre-colonial period, the, the term is not actually strictly science itself, but uh, it's actually known as indigenous science. Now, according to Pawilan and Sabisi, now, indigenous science includes complex arrays of knowledge, expertise, practices, and representations derived from traditional knowledge and practices that guide human societies. Now, if you look at this diagram, this is actually a simple framework created by Pawila. Now, indigenous science uses, of course, science process and skills. Remember, when we talk about science, it involves a step-by-step -step process. It involves procedures. Now, uh, our ancestors are guided by the, their culture and values. So they actually make use of their traditions and their belief. And that's actually uh, what the context of indigenous science is. On top of that, indigenous science is composed of traditional knowledge. And this has been passed on from generation to generation. Now, if you look at here, there are several definitions of indigenous science. As I've mentioned, Pawilen says that uh, indigenous science is uh, more of a traditional uh, knowledge and practice. Well, Ogawa mentioned that uh, indigenous science is collectively lived in and experienced by the people of a given culture. So it's more of the practical usage of the daily uh, life or, or the, the use of science in their daily life. So uh, Cajete, on the other hand, uh, says that it includes everything from metaphysics to philosophy and various practical technologies practiced by indigenous people, both past and present. Remember when we talk about technology, we talk about uh, tools. And even in the early times, our ancestors make use of several tools, let's say for farming, for hunting fish, or for, for hunting food, I should say, and for doing household chores. Even for cooking, They're, they actually create several tools and equipment that could help them make their life better. So that's indigenous science. According to Yacarino, science is a part of culture and how science is a part of culture and how it is done largely depends on the cultural practice of the people. So the application of 
indigenous science mainly depends on what ethnic group they belong, which tribe they belong, and the practices they do or the practices they have in their community. And all of those affect the application and the, the, their concept of what science is. Now, Johnston said that indigenous science refers to indigenous beliefs, develop desirable values that are relevant or consistent to scientific attitudes. Now, what are these desirable values that Johnston is talking about? The first one is motivating attitudes. The next one is cooperating attitudes. We have practical attitudes and reflective attitudes. So we see motivating attitudes. Of course, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, parents keep on motivating their children to adopt what they are doing so that they could pass it from generation to generation. And since they belong to a community, they cooperate with one another in order to, let's say, accomplish tasks and to do specific um uh, to do their responsibilities in their community. Back in the early times, we all know that when they hunt, they go in group. So when they do farming, they help each other and so on with other their, with other responsibilities. Khan, on the other hand, mentioned that indigenous science involves developmental stages of most sciences are characterized by continual competition between a number of distinct views of nature, each partially derived from and all roughly compatible with the dictates of scientific observation and method. Now, since everything, or let's say the resources that they need comes from nature, they were able to create certain processes and certain, um, let's say, uh, techniques, let's say for hunting or for fishing or for farming. So they were able to create some processes, some strategies or techniques in order to make those, uh, let's say, uh, responsibilities or tasks a lot better by, by using observations and other methods, let's say trial and error method or experimentation method. They are actually doing that, with, but without even knowing that they're actually doing those methods. So there's no, let's say, uh, a specific or right term for those, but they are just doing it all for the sake of discovering uh, what will make their life better. Now, Sibisi, said that it provides the basics of astronomy, pharmacology, food technology, or metallurgy, which were derived from traditional knowledge and practices. So let us not set aside this traditional knowledge and practices. Let's not set aside indigenous science because this is actually the foundation of every field of science that we have today, okay? Uh, uh, as you can see here, indigenous science uses science process skills such as observing, comparing, classifying, measuring, problem solving, inferring, communicating, and predicting. Now, indigenous science is guided by culture and community, and they were able to develop a general concept of what indigenous science is. Number one, the land is a source of life. So as we all know, they, uh, they get the resources from nature, and so they consider the land as their source of life, primarily because perhaps they are doing a lot of farming Okay, so uh, most of their food comes from the crops that they plant. And they considered the earth or, or they revered the earth as Mother Earth. And uh, they actually conceptualized that it is the origin of their identity as people. So all living and non-living things are interconnected and interdependent with each other. Perhaps as they observe or perhaps as they, uh, they continue their life, they've noticed that uh, these non-living things are essential for us livings to continue in our daily life. And, and for us to, you know, supply ourselves with nourishment, we need uh, these non-living things like water, the land that they till in order for them to, uh, to harvest their crops and, and so on. So uh, they also generalize that human beings are stewards or trustee of the land and other natural resources. And lastly, nature is a friend to human beings. So I hope even though we are progressing in terms of science and technology, despite the development of computers and whatnot, let us always remember that, uh, that nature is our friend, that we need to protect our mother earth, that we need to protect our environment because without the environment, of course, we will not be able to um, survive and of course, supply ourselves with essential things that we need, okay? 
Now, let's proceed now to the Spanish period. Now, please take note that the opening of the Suez Canal allowed liberal ideas to spread from Europe to the Philippines. The shipbuilding industry advanced as a result of the galleon trade. Now, remember, uh, during those times, uh, industries such as embroidery, tobacco, and weaving flourish after Philippines opened up to foreign trade. Now, the Spanish colonial period is widely regarded as the beginning of modern science and technology in the Philippines. And it was during this period that the Spaniards divided uh, large communities into reducción. Okay, they divided it into towns and cities, and it is where they actually collect tax from the people. Now, uh, even though uh, the Philippines slowly progressed, actually the, the progression is actually very slow, uh, although there is already trade and commerce, uh, the primary focus of the Spanish or, or, the, or the Spaniards is actually religious education. So that's why the greatest contribution of the Spaniards to us Filipinos is actually religious education. Now, let me add this, that the three goals of Spanish colonization is actually gold, God, and glory. Again, please take note of that. The three goals of Spanish colonization is God, gold, and glory. However, there is another goal. Uh, there's this goal of the Spaniards in terms of education. So the three goals of Spanish education is number one, the indoctrination of uh, uh, Spanish, uh, the indoctrination of Spanish belief, okay, particularly Catholicism. Remember, uh, or, or let me paraphrase that. So the first uh, goal of Spanish education is the indoctrination of Christianity. But take note that uh, during those times, the Spaniards were more focused on uh, allowing us Filipino to memorize the Bible. There's no deeper uh, teaching of the Bible during that time. And um, the Spaniards also taught us about the life of the saints. So that's why uh, most of the Catholics nowadays are so much adept. Okay, so much adapt to the life of the saints. And that's why they, they worship you know, the saints. So another goal of Spanish education is the promotion of Spanish language. Now, please take note that although the Spaniards were promoting the Spanish language, they actually make use of vernacular language, meaning the language available in that particular community. Okay, so that's the language they use. Okay, and they to, to teach Filipinos. Remember, Filipinos during those times doesn't know or Filipinos don't know how to speak Spanish yet. So the Spaniards were forced to learn vernacular language so that they can teach Filipinos how to speak in Spanish. Okay, and the last goal of Spanish education is uh, imposition of Spanish culture. Now, ano ba yung mga examples ng kultura na naipasa sa atin? Or ano yung proof of the existence of the Spanish culture in our country? One is, of course, yung mga festivals like Dinagyang, Sinulog, Ati Atihan. Nandyan din yung fiesta, like uh, particularly yung pinaka-famous na uh, Flores de Mayo. Lahat yan ay nanggaling sa mga Spaniards. And I would like to reiterate this also that uh, the Spaniards were able to pass on some traits onto us. And one of the traits na namana natin sa mga Spaniards ay, you, is actually it's a negative trait, a negative attitude, which is yung procrastination. So yan yung isa sa mga negative attitude na namana natin sa mga Spaniards. Now, Going back, now, because trade and commerce is established or, or uh, trade and commerce has already opened its door for the Filipinos, trade and commerce also resulted in the development of public amenities like transportation, lighting, banking, and information. So, marami nang nagbago, marami umunlad during those times. And those were actually products of science and technology. Okay. Now, Another one, I would like you to take 
note that the colonization of the Philippines by the Spaniards provided the Philippines with modern building materials such as bricks and tiles. In fact, in 1887, the Laboratorio Municipal Ciudad de Manila was established to address public health concerns and conduct medical research. So back then, perhaps siguro, no, marami na silang, uh, marami mga sakit na nagsusulputan. So the Spaniards uh, created or established the Laboratorio Municipal Ciudad in order for them to study these diseases and eventually create some uh, or, or in order for them to uh, help uh, cure you know, those diseases. Now, despite the fact that the Spaniards colonized the Philippines for over 300 years, science and technology did not develop to its full potential. This is due, now please take note of this, why did science and technology did not develop? Okay, why did science why did science and technology uh, did not develop into its full potential during the time of the Spaniards? This is due to superstitions and Catholic doctrines. Remember, during those times, the focus of the Spaniards is religious education. So uh, due to superstitions and Catholic doctrines and poor government administration, science and technology did not develop into its full potential. Okay. Now, science education during the Spanish period, um, during this time, early science education focused on the human body, plants, animals, and heavenly bodies. So early technology education focused on the use of development of tools for everyday life. So parang ganun pa rin sa, sa indigenous science. So mostly practical, vocational and yung mga nagagamit nila sa pang-araw-araw, ang focus ng science noon, or ng mga technologies na nade-develop nila. Now, higher education was centered in cities such as Manila. However, only a select few have access to these institutions, yung mga mayayaman lang, okay? Such as the Spaniards Mestizos and a few select Filipinos. Medicine and advanced sciences were introduced in former colleges and universities uh, established by the Catholic orders through training were generally poor. So talagang um, hindi ganoon, no? hindi ganoon ka, ka develop pa no? yung ating education system, primarily because there's no public school system during those times. And ang mga schools noon ay what they call parochial schools, and ang mga tinuturo talaga is mostly catechism. Okay? Yan talaga ang focus ng Spanish uh, period, on Spaniards during the Spanish period. Okay. Now, during this time, as I mentioned earlier, it was the opening of the Suez Canal that allowed the penetration of liberal ideas to the Philippines. Nung na-open ang Suez Canal at nagkaroon ng Galleon Trade, doon din na, kumbaga, na-awaken ang ating mga kababayan, particularly yung mga national heroes that you know, like Jose Rizal, they were able to learn the, the, the barbaric treatment and the drastic treatment of the Spaniards to the Filipinos. So the founding of the Real Sociedad Económica de los Amigos del Paris de Filipina encouraged agriculture and industry to eventually prosper. Now, as I've mentioned, Galleon trade allowed both goods and ideas from the West to reach the country. Though, ang nag-benefit talaga dito ay ang mga Spaniards. Remember, um, not all Filipinos were, I mean, majority of the Filipinos during this time were uneducated. Kaya, kamadali silang naloko, no, ng mga Ameri ng mga Spaniards at ng mga uh, other, other, other cultures, like sa mga Chinese and Japanese, madali naloko ang mga Filipinos noon because they are uneducated. And initially, agriculture and industry were neglected and their progress was slow. So, so as I've mentioned, talagang yung progress ng science and technology was very, very slow during the time of the Spanish era. Now, however, the founding, as I've mentioned, the founding of the Real Sociedad Económica de los Amigos del Paris de Filipina encourage agriculture and industry to prosper. So there were many crops, many crops were cultivated and some industries were developed. And when the Philippines became open for foreign trade, industries such as embroidery, tobacco, and weaving, we were able to successfully, no, successfully trade with other, uh, other cultures, okay? Now, let's now move on to the American period. Now, the public education system during this time is free with English as a medium of instruction. In fact, in 1901, the Americans established the public education system, which is 
and established the Department of Public Instruction. This is actually the name of DepEd. This is the first name of the Department of Education. Now, basic education focused on nature studies and science and sanitation during that time. So normal schools were established. Ano ba example ng normal school? Well, the one of the most famous is, of course, the Philippine Normal School, which is now the Philippine Normal University. On top of that, Hindi lang Philippine Normal School or Philippine Normal University ang na-establish. Uh, during the time of the Americans, na-establish din ang University of the Philippines. So it was during the American colonization that the University of the Philippines was established. The university started with mostly foreign teachers and professors. And Filipinos were sent, you know, uh, Filipinos were actually some of the Philippines were actually very privileged during that time because they were given scholarships and they were sent abroad, okay, to uh, study. And later on, itong mga scholars na to na nag-aral sa ibang bansa ang umuwi at bumalik sa ating bansa and pinalitan nila yung mga foreigners na nasa University of the Philippines. Now, by 1905, the Bureau of Science was established to foster the advancement of science and technology. All right. Now, science and technology focus on agriculture, food processing, forestry, medicine, and pharmacy. Now, the Americans established the Bureau of Government Laboratories in 1901 to deal with the study of tropical diseases and laboratory projects. Now, this was replaced with the Bureau of Science in 1905 to nurture the development of science and technology. Now, in this bureau, serums and prophylactics needed by the Philippine General Hospital and Bureau of Health were manufactured and diseases were studied. So, mas lalong nag-advance no, yung ating science and technology because of the establishment of the Bureau of Science. Okay, now let's move on naman sa post-colonial period. Now, during the post-colonial period, please take note that there was a decline no? since uh, kumbaga, after the Americans left bumagsak or nagkaroon ng decline sa ating science and technology. And because of this, okay, the Science Act of 1958 was enhanced. This established the National Science Development Board, the Philippine Atomic Energy Commission, and the National Institute of Science and Technology. And by the 1960s, the Philippine Inventors Commission and Philippine Coconut Research Institute were also established. Now, ang isa sa mga pinakagusto kong tandaan ninyo during this time, during the post-colonial period, is when President Josado Macapagal established the Philippine Science High School with the hope of strengthening or for with the hope of uh, the the with the hope of uh, educating the young ones and, and for kumbaga um, kumbaga, training them and, and, and teaching them uh, more about science and technology. Okay, now uh, after the colonization by Japan, the country focused on building institutions and public facilities such as schools, hospitals, and transportation systems, as well as providing technical training and human resource development. So, human resource development focused uh, on producing engineers. So yung mga kailangan-kailangan natin. Kaya yung ating government during that time ay talagang kumbaga nagsumikap na mas makapag-produce ng mas maraming engineers, scientists, technology experts, doctors, and other professionals. Now, um, during the Marcus administration, okay, um, actually dito sa panahon ni Marcos talaga nagkaroon ng kumbaga pag unlad no or pagbabago or development in terms of science and technology so uh, during his term many agencies were established as uh, for example the established sa panahon niya yung uh, national grains authority please take note of that national grains authority which is now national food authority na established din sa panahon ni uh, ni Marcos ang uh, uh, Philippine Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration or PAGASA. Again, sa panahon ni Marcos, na-establish ang PAGASA, which means Philippine uh, Atmospheric Geophysical and Astronomical Services Administration. 
So, maraming, actually maraming nabuo no, sa panahon ni Marcos. Andiyan din ang National Academy of Science and Technology. So, it was during the time of Marcos na talagang nagkaroon ng pagbulusok no, sa science and technology. Now, during the time of Gloria Macapagal Arroyo naman, okay, um, now, during the time of Gloria Macapagal, nagkaroon ng tinatawag na Philippine Novation, which actually uh which actually um focuses on uh improving uh the country's economic status by uh helping philippines or helping filipinos to become an asian innovation powerhouse so yan ang pinaka focus ng philippine innovation okay under joseph estrada naman the number of science and technology professionals grew and there were uh, more Philippine high schools built and the healthcare services were also prioritized during the time of uh, President Joseph Estrada. Okay, uh, please take note also that during the time of uh, President Corazon Aquino, he replaced or she replaced NSTA or National Science and Technology Authority to DOST. So, see. President Corazon Aquino ang nagpalit or nagbigay ng pangalang DOST or Department of Science and Technology. So it was during the time of Corazon Aquino that the uh, Science and Technology Master Plan was created. Now the goal of the uh, Science and Technology Master Plan is for the Philippines to achieve newly industrialized country status by the year 2000. So yan ang target ng uh, Science and Technology or Science and Technology Master Plan ni President Corazon Aquino. Okay. Uh, the, uh, during the time of President Rodrigo Duterte naman, ay na-establish ang Philippine Development Plan. So the Philippine Development Plan, which was uh, targeted to uh, happen from 2017 to 2022, is a massive undertaking aimed at improving the country's infrastructure, increasing energy access, lowering citizen costs, maintaining economic growth, and adhering to global climate change and sustainable growth agreements. So, ano ba tong target no, ng Philippine Development Plan? It is the target, one of the target of the Philippine Development Plan is for the Philippines to be an upper middle income country by 2022. And that growth will be more inclusive as manifested by a lower poverty incidence in rural areas. So from 30% in 2015 to 20% in 2022. Another goal of the PDP is for the Philippines to have a high level of human development by 2022 and the unemployment rate will decline from 5.5% to 3.5% in 2022. Now, it is also the goal of PDP to uh, that there will be greater trust in government and in society. Individuals and communities will be more resilient and Filipinos will have greater drive for innovation. But unfortunately, as you can see, because of the pandemic, na apektuhan talaga itong, uh, kubaga, pag, uh, itong um, kubaga, pagpapanukala or itong uh, plans no, ni President Rodrigo Duterte. So, uh, Nobody wanted the pandemic, by the way, so hindi rin natin in-anticipate na mangyayari iyon. And because of that, uh, the pandemic greatly influenced the, the impact of the Philippine Development Plan. Okay? Now, here you can see the pillars of the Philippine Development Plan. So the first one is malasakit. I, I would like you to just focus. Uh, pag sinabi natin uh, malasakit, no, ang goal nito is to regain people's trust in public institutions and each other. Now, pag sinabi naman natin pagbabago, this is focused on inclusive growth which includes universal social protection, basic education, and other social services will be improved and while also raising the countries, or while also raising the country's status in the global market. And pag sinabi natin patuloy na pag-unlad, actually ang target ng ating uh, Pangulo no, ay maging manufacturing-focused powerhouse ang ating bansa, like China. Okay? So that uh, there will be continuous economic growth. So there is a great demand in manufacturing services kasi, like in China. So our country wanted to be uh, a manufacturing-focused powerhouse. Okay. 
Now, this time we'll be focusing on the 10 outstanding Filipino scientists who made remarkable contribution to our country. So the very first one is Enrique Mapua, Austria. So ang tatandaan nyo lang pag sinabi natin or pag binanggit si Enrique Mapua, Austria, number one, he is a neonatologist. So he focuses on neonatals, no? yung uh, pag-analyze, okay? uh, uh, actually pag pag uh, pagsusuri no sa mga neonatal si mga nasa sinapupunan pa ng tiyan ng at ng mga pregnant woman okay so ano ba yung focus ng meconium analysis so the focus of the meconium analysis which was created by Enrique Mapua is to detect prenatal exposure to drugs so dinidigdan nila kung yung mga fetuses pa o yung mga prenatal babies ay kubaga na expose sa harmful drugs you know there are some women who who are uh, who use uh kubaga illegal drugs so gusto nilang makita kung yung bang prenatal babies ay kubaga exposed sa ganitong klasing harmful drugs so yan yung naging trabaho ni Enrique Mapua Austria then we have Jose Bejar Cruz Jose Bejar Cruz naman is actually known for uh, his theory and practice of automated control okay uh, in fact in 1970s and in 1980s uh, his work on the control of leader follower systems is still considered one of the major contributions of the half century. And he is also named an officer of the renowned Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. So yan yung naging contribution ni Jose Bejar Cruz Jr. Okay. Next, we have Marie Jo Panganiban Luis. She is well known for her abilities as an educator and graph theory. So again, yan ang tatandaan nyo kay Marie Jo Panganiban Luis. Kay Josefino, that's Josefino Pacas Comiso naman, ang kanyang kubaga, remarkable contribution ay his study which revealed the outstanding rate at which Arctic sea ice is melting. He was a prominent figure in a global project to monitor the planet's rapidly dwindling perennial sea ice cover. And he authored a report on the subject. So nakakatuwa, I mean, nakaka-proud na isang Filipino ang actually nakapag-study no, sa pag-melt ng, ng Arctic ice, which actually contributes to the increase in the sea level. And uh, actually, that's because of this study, uh, kumbaga nag-pioneer din ito doon sa other researches na may mga lugar, no? hindi lang sa Pilipinas, kundi sa iba't ibang panig ng mundo na wawawala as the Arctic, as the Arctic ice continues to melt. Okay, so next one, we have Rafael Dineros Guerrero. Si Rafael Dineros Guerrero naman ay known for his contribution to the improvement of sex reversal and hatchery techniques, both of which help in the commercial production of yielding market-sized fish. Particularly, no, ang isda na pinag-aralan ni Rafael Dineros Guerrero III ay tilapia. So, uh, ang, ang layunin, so the goal of this study is to increase the production of tilapias. And of course, you know, we are quite aware that there's already scarcity in uh, aquatic supply or in aquatic resources and in some fishes. So, this study actually help you know, increase the production of fish, particularly tilapia. Okay. Next, we have Lillian for Malejo Patena. Lillian from Alejo Patena is known for discovering the seedless lime and pomelo varieties because of uh, kubaga, he was well known for plant biotechnology research. So yan na naging contribution niya. Next, we have Fabian Millardairit. Pag sinabing Fabian Millardairit, tandaan niyo lang Lagundi. Okay? He studied the phytochemical analysis of Lagundi and the development of Lagundi as uh, kubaga, a a medicine, no, particularly for cough and related uh, illnesses and diseases. Okay, we have Ramon Cabanos Barba. He is well known for inventing floral induction in mango plants. So the significance and effect of his findings, along with his self motivation to assist others, led him to transform how mangoes and other crops are produced across the world. So hindi lang pang bansa natin yung naging study ni. Ramon Barba kundi nagamit din ito ng ibang ban, ng ibang uh, kubaga, ng ibang kultura or ng ibang bansa uh, in in yielding and increasing their mango production in other other uh, plants no na or other crops okay 
Next, we have Lourdes Hansoy Cruz. She's a Filipino scientist whose work has advanced our understanding of the biochemistry of poisonous peptides derived from the venom of fish hunting conus marine snails. And lastly, we have Gregory Ligo Tangonon, Tangonan. Okay. He played a key role in the development of optoelectronic applications in radar, optical networking, and analog systems. So those are our top 10 or 10 outstanding Filipino scientists. Now, for the last part of our, our discussion, we'll be focusing on the history of the science schools in the Philippines. So I just incorporated here or added here uh, the important concepts. Okay, about the science schools in the Philippines. So first one, we have the Philippine Science High School System. Uh, the, the education here is founded on a curriculum that prioritizes, of course, science and mathematics. And the aim of the Philippine Science High School is to prepare students for careers in science and technology. So please take note of that. Next, we have Special Science Elementary School Project. Ano ba ang focus nito? This project focuses on imparting scientific and technological learning skills and values to Filipino children. Okay. Next, we have Quezon City Regional Science High School. It was actually first known as Quezon City Science High School. The, the objective is to give as many opportunities as possible for science-gifted children to cultivate an inquisitive and creative attitude. And we have Manila Science High School. It is actually the first Okay, the first science high school in the country. The program includes science and mathematics significantly, but of course, its vision is to develop scientists with souls. So, yun ang pinaka-target ng Manila Science High School. Okay, last one on our list of science schools is Central Design Institute Foundation. Okay, the dynamic learning program in this uh, foundation or in this school is a synthesis of classical and current pedagogical approaches that aim to maximize learning creativity and productivity. Actually, it is the precursor and progenitor of the well-known dynamic learning program. Now, it hosts worldwide seminars to promote the exchange of ideas on cutting-edge physics and mathematics fields. In fact, it founded the Research Center for Theoretical Physics in 1992. But, you know, honestly, I feel a little bad knowing that this science high schools only cater a few, okay? And somehow, it's also selective because just like yung, uh, just like yung density, uh, regional Science High School, no, it uh, provides opportunities mostly to science gifted students. So I I hope and pray na mas lalo talagang dumami or maipakalat no itong science schools na to sa buong bansa so that more uh, children or more students will be exposed to science and mathematics. And kumbaga, maiangat natin yung patuloy na pagbaba ng kalidad ng, or pagbaba ng ating rating sa science and math. So I hope na talagang magawan ito ng paraan ng ating gobyerno. Okay? So that ends our discussion. Now, if you have any question, just feel free to comment your question on the chat box or in the space provided in the comment section. So thank you very much for listening and I'll see you in our next discussion. Thank you very much.